Testing, can you hear us? I can hear now. Oh, fabulous. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, happy Friday, everybody. We're going to do that again. <laughs> Welcome to our Women in Leadership series. This is part of our Council on Women and Girls, and we are so happy to have some remarkable trailblazing women leaders in agriculture. Yes, that's 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 all of you. That is all of you. And um, we're excited to highlight these amazing women leaders in agriculture. Uh, we got this idea actually when we were standing in Farmington in the middle of a field. And the commissioner was telling me that a lot of our newest farmers in Connecticut are women. And I said, well, I've met some amazing women leaders in agriculture. We have to get together and highlight them and hopefully inspire more girls and young women to do this really important work. Uh, and there's a science about it, and you're gonna hear more about that. There's also an art to it. We're gonna hear more about that. Uh, and I can't think of a better thing to be doing on Friday afternoon than talking about farming with fabulous women leaders. I grew up on a farm, so that's why I'm very excited about this. There's the most beautiful lettuce over there that Reverend Sarah is going to show you. <laughs> so we're looking forward to hearing from this incredible uh, panel, and I'm happy to be joined by, with Jamie Smith, who is the Bureau Director at uh, the Department of Agriculture to help me moderate. So thank you very thank you. much. She's the one wearing the Connecticut grown pin over here. And at this time, I'm going to let Jamie say a few words about what she does and why she's here. Well, thank you for the invitation and seeing the value in ag and, and what an economic driver it is for Connecticut's economy. It is a $4 billion industry that I think a lot of times people don't realize, and I appreciate seeing the value in that and importance of that. And, and it employs 20,000 yes, plus people. Yes, it sure does. Yeah. Um, it is National Agriculture Week, um, which is pretty awesome. We uh, hosted Ag Day at the Capitol on Wednesday, where we had an opportunity to showcase overall how diverse and dynamic the industry is. And I'm really excited to have the four of you women here today. We had a great conversation yesterday and I'm looking forward to our conversation uh, again today. Um, and, you know, I think each of you have a really unique story. You all do something a little bit different. And I hope by the time we're done, um, folks who are joining us and, and watching us virtually will have an opportunity to hear the the different aspects of the industry that they can get into, right? It's not just, you don't have to just be a farmer to be an ag. There's so many other places that you can participate in the industry. So, so thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you so much to our panelists for joining. And we're gonna start with Reverend Sarah, my twin flames, since we <laughs> both grew up on farms. And, um, she is doing just extraordinary work in Bridgeport, and I've had the opportunity to see it firsthand. And I wasn't sure what I was walking into, but I saw the most extraordinary uh, hydroponic indoor farm in an inner city and in a very unusual place. So Reverend Sarah, tell us about your path and how you came up with the idea of Nourish and what you're doing there. Um, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It's good to see you and you and I've just met my new buddies and uh, that dig, uh, roll up our students and dig in, no farm pun intended. Um, my name is Reverend Sarah. I'm president and CEO of Nourish Bridgeport. I'm also senior minister of the oldest church in Bridgeport, but um, nobody cares about that much anymore. So, um, but what I'm excited to tell folks about is, see, my daddy was the last farmer in 17 generations uh, where I grew up on a farm in, Connecticut, uh, in the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. And none of the four children went into agriculture because we lost everything. So it was like we had to find other, other careers. So I became a lawyer and this and that. Well, now I'm getting to 
redeem my daddy just a bit. He's long gone, but um, I got this grant a month before COVID to do something transformational. We have one of the largest food pantries in Bridgeport. The need is enormous. 25% of all residents of Bridgeport are food insecure. They do not know where they're gonna eat tomorrow. And we run the pantry and I looked and they had rotted carrots and potatoes and maybe a moldy cabbage, woo. And um, I thought, surely we can do better. Why are the poorest of the people, the people at the bottom of the food chain getting the worst? We can turn that equation around. So like I said, it was a month before COVID. I got this grant. Well, you know, we were just doing good to get groceries out the door in our hazmat, right? So uh, we never closed. And um, so then we finally got settled. And I took this idea to my board who thought I had grown another, you know, I have three heads. And now they think it's their idea, but whatever. Now you've got um, like 300 heads of Yeah, that's right. And so we took an empty warehouse, 5,000 square feet. We cleaned it up. And we built during COVID, which, you know, you never contract anything, but we gave 10 contractors jobs doing something very unusual. Now they have a new thing on their resume. And now we have 10 farm hands that run our farm. And so we're the first indoor hydroponic nonprofit farm in that half of the state. And we, our goal is to get all this beautiful, beautiful, this is green domain. It cannot be grown in Connecticut soil. So, so we can't, right? And it literally is water, light, nutrients, no chemicals, no pesticides. You should never, I mean, I put a thing of water, just eat it. And so we've done little baby carrots. We've done all these herbs. We've done 40 different varieties. The basil is just fabulous. Yes, I mean, it will make you weep. Um, and uh, so what we're trying to do is grow and grow and grow more, but we have four different methods. And we've had people along the way uh, to help teach us how to do that. And so it's always a learning, right? And we've now, since June 1st of last year, distributed to people in need 2.5 tons of fresh produce. That's and a lot of lettuce. That's a hell of a lot of lettuce. That's right. Yeah. And so anyway, I brought some green and I brought some, what's this, green star. But more importantly, I, I want to lift up that when this cap, when this lands in the pantries, they don't even know what to do with themselves. They're like, oh. yeah. And I want to tell, tell you the story. I told it on Wednesday. There was the woman, I've known her for years. She always gets groceries because we become the grocery. Food pantries are the grocery in food deserts. And so we're set up like a grocery. You get and you come in and you choose. You have a little cart. It's very cute. And I said, Marie, look, we grew this. Now, she did not care about that. <laughs> what she cares, she goes, oh, we never get green. We eat green tonight. And to get that, because here's another statistic. The average age of death in Bridgeport, and I'm sliding into it this summer, is 60. I know I don't look like it, but I am. You do not. Uh, and the average age, 10 minutes down the road in a fluent, beautiful village of Westport. Nothing wrong with being affluent. <laughs> in fact, I love rich people. Um, <laughs> but is that average age of death is 79. That's 19 years for 10 miles. Now, some of it's violence, some of it's that, but most of it's nutrition. So we're trying to get the most nutritious food. And also by growing things you can't grow in Connecticut, you don't have to go to California. God bless them. They're under dire straits right now. And it doesn't have to haul across the United States. And so I love that you farm. have it in paper containers instead of those plastic mm -hmm. tubs. Yes. And that's one of the things we were talking about is the container. When you get to the question about what's your challenge is how to, like we, we had to hole punch it because it needs aeration and we want it to hold because this was picked this morning. There's so no good. travel time. It's no, it's it's allowed to mature. So it's four times more nutritious. So anyway, I feel like my daddy is sort of going, wow, you know, she's a farmer after all. <laughs> and but more importantly, we're feeding people that have so few options. Let's give them the best. And that's what I want to be a part of at Nourish Bridge. Okay, so there's only one little bit that you left out that I think is really important. Well, 
who is helping you farm? Oh, well, yes, you I've got, uh, well, I told you, we have gotten lots of help from people and especially from the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. We got a farm viability award and that, um, in fact, I need that second half, Jamie. Oh, <laughs> okay. 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 Well, that's totally is not where I was going. <laughs> but, but I was hoping that you would talk about who your farmers are and where they come from. Yes, and I, um, all of our uh, farmers are from other places and uh, learn the language, learn the training. And Leslie Albello is our farm manager from Puerto Rico. And we have somebody from Mexico. We have somebody from Nicaragua and we've got somebody uh, I mean, you know, I don't know where they're from, but somewhere. And it's wonderful. We've hired uh, student interns from college. And so we got a large ARPA grant from the city of Bridgeport for workforce development, innovative workforce development. And so we've now given people, these are folks that used our pantry. Now they have a job and a paycheck and a skill. And that is just as important as the food, right? So they could, you know, so love that. Love anyway, that. I, I do, I love that. And um, I am so pleased to be here and hear about all the other exciting things, but I'm into growing and growing healthy and getting it to the people that need it the most. And I'm so pleased that Nourish Bridgeport with your all's help and other people's have been able to do that. Amen, Reverend Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next up? So um, we're going to turn it over to, we're going to go talk to Susie. And Susie, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do, what you grow, um, which is pretty unique and special? Um, and then can you tell us how you got into farming and, and how you started your own company? Sure, yeah. Um, also, tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I teared up a little bit, too. Um, so unlike Reverend Sarah, I uh, have no background in farming at all. I grew up, um, I'm a Puerto Rican girl from New Jersey. We were landlocked for all intents and purposes, even though we were right outside of New York City. It's not water that's accessible or essentially usable for food in any real way. Um, and uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, we wound up in the beautiful state of Connecticut and we decided, my husband and I decided we were rehabbing a marina that we were gonna try this cool thing that we had read was really good for the environment, which was um, starting an aquaculture farm and growing uh, sugar kelp, which is a macroalgae. And uh, the environmental side of it, the reason that we kind of both were really interested in it is in order, like kelp, kelp is essentially a sponge for carbon and nitrogen out of the water. So it's a direct way to impact climate change. So it can reduce ocean acidification. Um, it leaves the ocean better off than it started. You know, when you line grow seaweed out in the uh, water, it creates habitat for fish. It can be a barrier for storm surges. Um, and with that nitrogen piece, it, with it absorbing nitrogen over the winter, it is uh, helping reduce harmful algal blooms, which can be toxic to a whole host of different species. And then at the same time, we're also growing uh, food that is a superfood. It requires zero inputs. I don't have to use any fresh water. I don't have to use any soil. I don't have to use any fertilizer. I don't have to use anything. It grows. I like to joke, it grows in spite of me. We just put, <laughs> we put the seaweed out on the um, permitted site which is in 30 feet of water in the Fisher's Island Sound. Mm -hmm. And it just does its own thing. Uh, we tend, we, when I say we tend the farm, we're really just going out and checking gear, taking water samples, doing things like that. Um, so this was a complete like 180 from where we were going uh, or where I just kind of saw my life going. It was um, the barriers to entry for this were not incredibly high. Um, and I found that the work was so much more fulfilling than the uh, market research that I did in my past life. So it's been really fun. It's been very challenging because there's a lot of learning curves. People not only are surprised to learn that this is something that can be cultivated, but also what the heck do you do with it after you pull it out? Of I was going to say, <laughs> so who do you sell it to and why didn't you bring us this? Thing? I actually do have some, <laughs> I actually do have some candy <laughs> kelp with me. And I, it's like a, it's like my little nerd snack, but it's, it's like sea glass and it's delicious. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So cool. You can dive in if you want. Um, so we sell our seaweed primarily to restaurants. It does look like glass. Yes. Yeah. So cool. Um, we sell our seaweed primarily to restaurants. It's um, a lot of 
you know, restaurants interested in sustainability, farm to table, that whole sort of vibe. What I'm really trying to do is get seaweed in the hands of the waterfront community who traditionally doesn't have access to these restaurants. So finding partners like Reverend Sarah, where I can take my crop and, and donate it to that food pantry, creates a connection between what, you know, these uh, pantry guests are looking right out of the ocean and seeing like, this is where this is coming from. This cleans yeah. the ocean, yeah. this improves their environment, and it also nourishes you. It's very high cool. in um, iron, calcium, it's a superfood. So the, the seaweed that I buy at the grocery store is, um, you know, very sort of fat and long, and you put it in soup. Yes. When you you make soup, you put it in the broth, and it's a really great, great. flavor, but it's also Absolutely. very nutritious. And what's so wonderful about having access to fresh and locally cultivated seaweed Absolutely. is that about 95% of seaweed that's purchased in the United States, it's imported from overseas. And so you're getting, even if there not aren't any preservatives. Grown. Yes, yeah. and not locally grown. Our farm is the largest commercial seaweed farm in the state of Connecticut. And I always joke that that and a buck 50 can get me on the bus because we're also one of three. And this is the sort of industry where there's so much room. We have wonderful water quality here. There's so much room to grow. Um, if people were interested in, in it, there's a wonderful nonprofit that we partnered with called Green Wave that helped us establish our farm. Um, and took us through the permitting process, the partners at the Bureau of Aquaculture where we work, the partners at the Department of Ag, it's, you know, people are here to help you navigate what feels like very um, uncharted waters, to <laughs> insert my own that. pun. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's been a ride, that's for sure. Um, How long have you been doing this? We are, we're about to do our sixth harvest. So I started the farm on maternity leave with my youngest daughter. Oh. <laughs> and we always refer to her like the kelp. She, she is the physical marker of our kelp farm. So she's a first grader now. So we have a first grade farm. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. And can I just ask, so I just read uh, this morning that there's this huge mass of seaweed floating along our shoreline and it was written about as if it was a bad thing yeah and so you're saying the only good things come out of seaweed so this is there are i mean seaweed is the reason that there's oxygen on earth you take a breath you're more likely you're you're breathing uh air that came from micro or macro algae is out in the ocean for the most part i think it's uh, like you know two to two to one two from the ocean one from terrestrial plants. There's all different types, just like people. So um, certain, good certain seaweed, seaweed yeah, there's, there's good, there's bad. And so when I talked about those harmful algal blooms, like the, the sugar kelp that is cultivated off the shores can absorb nitrogen from the water. But that same nitrogen, if left in the water, which usually comes from humans and runoff that we're kind of, you know, we don't necessarily do responsible things all the times. Um, that nitrogen, if left in the water, will attract uh, very prolific and um, potentially toxic algaes that can right. bloom if given the right conditions. So what we're trying to do are keep the conditions um, as they are or maybe improve upon them uh, so that those harmful algaes don't wind up impacting ecosystems they and having take over. Yeah, they'll, they'll take over and they'll choke out fisheries. So it's not just like the seaweed farms can help support the fishing industry as well. So it's, so it's invasive seaweed, like an in, like an invasive. It's it, it's invasive seaweed. They're they're naturally occurring if we give them the room to grow. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you know staph infection on your skin. Like in certain conditions, if you know you're, I say this as a mom. I feel like every mom's like yes, yeah. no, yes, we all know about it. Um, yeah. So we just want to per, keep keep the environment in a way that allows us to continue to responsibly harvest from it. And that is, that's a point about uh, the hydroponic farming that, that you do, Reverend Sarah, is that um, with climate change, it's going to be harder and harder for farmers to farm outside. So farming inside is a really good thing. And I think, uh, Lieutenant Governor, in 10 years, we'll all have one of our simple fork farm units in our basement if you're talking about feeding people. It doesn't mean you won't have soil farmers, but if you live in a city, or in an urban area, and we want to feed all these people, we're going to have to start growing it in different ways like this. Yeah, right. Like you're doing. I, I mean, I say the same thing about seaweed. It's a climate change food. So whether or not you like it, you better get used to it because mm -hmm. without requiring any of the resources that are so stressed right now, 
I mean, it's it can be grown. It, it's very nourishing and um, it's native to this area, which is so cool. cool. Yeah. That is very cool. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to turn to another demographic of farmers that we don't always see, and um, we are so happy that you are here, Lauren. So. Um, there are very few people of color who are farmers in Connecticut. And tell us uh, what brought you here, what you do, what you find uh, so compelling about it. Yes. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I would first say that like my love for teaching and working with students has been the thing that got me interested. Um, what my company does is educates and entertains and really helps youth and their families to have that personal relationship with nature and to also have fun. And the reason why I started is um, I'm wearing this pen because I did a program called Public Allies, which is really kind of beneficial in my life. And we, I was with a really good friend of mine and we decided to develop a urban agriculture program based upon direct student feedback of saying, what do you wanna learn about nature and how can we do that? We created that called Gaia's Guides. And you know that curriculum is based in science, it has like a character, each character has a jingle and a dance and a storyline that really creates these anthropomorphic characters that really helps the kids to kind of see that direct connection. But it's also in an area where they, they kind of feel like nature has to, you have to go somewhere else to experience nature. No, you can do that right in the city, right in Hartford, and really kind of experience that in your own. I'm not actually from Hartford, I'm from Winter Locks. And so when I came here, I really um, got the opportunity to see how urban growing is done differently. Um, and so the reason why I got involved in it is to serve my students um, to make sure that they have adequate food. And also, this is what they said they want to do. They want to learn about farming. They're interested in it. Also, a lot of their families come from farming backgrounds and they have a lot of skills. So a lot of people in Hartford and in urban areas know how to grow. They just don't have that access. Um, and so the way I started is I um, was working um, and I brought my curriculum to different programs and I um, decided to start learning a little edutainment because I was also just like a victim of like racism and really trying to do this work and seeing all the barriers. And so the reason why I created my company is to make sure that we can address some of those social inequities um, and to really support other black women, other people of color um, to make sure they have the same access. I would say the biggest issue is there's no land access. You know, the policies put in place do not uplift us and we need money and we need support to be able to do that. Um, and so I got into it because I like to grow food and I like to eat. And so um, really being able to connect with different schools um, to be able to have food distribution and to do activities and to have fun is important. Um, so what I do is I go into different schools and we do lessons. I work closely with the teachers to make sure that it's aligned with the school curriculum and that it kind of feeds into what that school community is. It's all about kind of building those relationships. So like I recently, um, for the second year, I got the CT Kids with CT Grown grant, which is really, really important to teaching kids. Um, and we are gonna be teaching pre-K to be involved with how to prepare their food, how to grow their food, because the students really love going over to the garden and pulling out their own produce that they're growing. Um, but then also, you know, farming and growing food isn't just about eating, it's about building community, and it's about making sure that people know what the natural resources are in their area. Um, and I feel like that understanding is really important to help us to develop wealth and to make sure it's within our community and to collaborate. I would not be here without all of my partners like Kenny Park Sustainability Project and Micro to Life, giving y'all some shout outs because they do some great work. There are, hard, there are farmers in Bridgeport, in New Haven that- Waterbury. We, Waterbury, we all kind of work together and connect. So like a lot of the urban farmers really have to rely on community and collaboration. But also I can't stress enough addressing some of the racism and the inequalities and the hoarding of resources in the nonprofit industrial complex of some organizations that do not properly make sure that they're not poverty funded. You know, and it's it's important for us to be able to make that change and have accountability to help whoever is kind of you know stuck in the past and some traditions at work, help them to kind of go to the next level so we can all kind of be working together. Um, and also supporting the environment. As climate change is happening, I feel like we're gonna have to really adjust how we grow, You know, use different species and focus on community ecology. Me growing something on my own, that's not gonna work. 
I need to be growing up with my students based upon their feedback and finding opportunities and, and avenues for them to have their own space. So I want to tell you about uh, an, an initiative that our uh, education commissioner, Charlene Russell Tucker, had. So we took $20,000 grants and had high school kids from all over the state compete for them. And they had to come up with projects to do with the money. And the reason I bring it up is in so many high schools, and I remember visiting one with the commissioner in Bristol and another in South Windsor, the kids said, we want to have community gardens at the school. Mm -hmm. Say they could do a project at a school. So some kids came up with, you know, like a mental health relaxation room as an idea. I know we yeah, need one of those at the Capitol. I did not have one of those at the Capitol, right? But there were a lot of projects, which, which won, which were to grow um, food to share with community members on school property. Yeah. And the kids were into uh, deciding what to plant. And, and the kids also, there was like a civics uh, component. Kids voted on it. So I'm telling you, because, you know, to your point about kids really yeah. wanted to learn about it kids were voting for these community garden food growing projects. So you have to connect with the education commissioner and get those schools because they would love your yes. curriculum. Yes. Yes. They would. I've, I've seen, seen her in action and it's pretty spectacular. Yes. And the awareness she's bringing to children, um, I shared this story yesterday when we, when we casually got together, you know, to have, what were those, junior high students? Yeah. You know, we she had them out in their school garden and they were so hesitant to even pick a radish. They did, they, 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 they're like, I'm like, just get in there. And, you know, and it's so, I'm so thankful that um, we have someone like Lauren who's able to sort of bring awareness and bring, a, you know, joy and education to farming um, to, to to younger kids, so that's great. Yeah. And it's also to shout out UConn. So there was a UConn student who had a whole project of building a hydroponic garden in front of a community health center in Hartford and um, had this huge garden. And I forgot how many thousands of pounds of food that they grew during the course of the summer. and. The uh, so part of it was to provide food, but the other part was to have families in the neighborhood start their own, yes. right? Yeah. In a limited amount of space, it's amazing because this was just like a little square of land, you know, next to the parking lot of a health center. That so, another very cool. Yeah. I'll never forget the time we had uh, raised beds on asphalt out in the parking lot. <laughs> And I took kids out there and we pulled the carrots and I'm just eating it. You can't do it. I said, of course you can. I said, this is as good as it gets. <laughs> and they, but they just have to have that exposure. I think what you're doing is remarkable. Yeah, Thank you. Wonderful. And I also feel like they need to have trust yeah. um, and see that stuff that they're having at home will be food that they're going to get in the cafeteria. And, you know, focusing on those local producers and families that are growing in their backyards have those financial opportunities. The kids need to see people who look like them and represent them um, and can see people being successful. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I am the only black woman, maybe one or two of us where I've been to schools and the student says, I've never seen farmers like you. I didn't know that could happen. And wow. some young, some of my, a lot of my students have been like, I wanna be a farmer, I wanna do this. And so them being able to see that that's possible is super, super key. And I can't express enough how I wanna support the ability for other black and brown students to have the opportunity to farm so we can continue that. Like there's no competition. If we grow too much food, ooh. Lauren also serves on our diversity, equity, and inclusion working group that the agency has, and she's been a great voice. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to our other Lauren, um, who is our only multi-generational farmer on the panel today. Um, you also happen to be a veteran, uh, Lauren. So thank you for your service. And can you tell us what brought you back to the farm after you finished your service? Yeah, so I grew up farming just down the road 
um, on a hundred plus year old farm, fourth generation. My kids are fifth generation uh, mountain farm. And I, I left, I mean, I went to Yukon. I did the whole ag school thing and natural resources. And I said, you know, I, I just kind of want something more. You know, there's this physical strength, there's this uh, intellectual power that I felt and I just wasn't using it anywhere. And um, I thought, how am I gonna, how am I gonna stand on my own ground, find my power, you know, um, use this. And so I joined the army, um, just kind of out of the blue. You know, I do actually have a pretty extensive family background in the military. Uh, and I had a great time. You know, I, I deployed in 02 to 03 for the initial invasion into Iraq and just a, an epic experience with some fantastic people. I'm currently working with more of them now in my consulting business and I love it. Um, and when I was done, I traveled around, did some odd jobs but in the environmental field and um, was married, decided to get divorced, moved back to Connecticut and uh, the market crashed. So I said, well, what can I do? I can figure out how to start a business. I can keep working with my family. My dad was still doing construction. So we finished up a couple jobs, rebuilt a house and I was farming. So farming full time. And so 60 to 80 hours a week in the fields, um, managing, you know, my cousins at the time, who I adore, were, were working at the stand along other people. So it was really like, it was a coming back to my family kind of as an adult, like a coming home situation really. And sort of regrouping after that time and, and who am I and where am I going? And um, <laughs> I still have this intensity. I mean, it's just who I am. And and I didn't have an outlet for that again. So I continued farming and I and I loved it. I loved getting back with with my family. And I love the physical aspect of it. You know, I was, I was wearing myself out every day. I was um, 130 acres will do that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, providing providing something to a community and and a service, a greater service for a greater good, which is what I felt, you know, in, in the military. And so Lauren, you continued that with the establishment of the Farm Farmer Venture Coalition. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So now I am the vice president of the Farmer Veteran Coalition, Connecticut chapter. The Farmer Veteran Coalition is a national group, and we've established our own local chapter. And I past couple of years has been very tumultuous for most people. You know, I was up and down in my in my business and what, what am I gonna do? I started a consulting business to help people in agriculture to do project planning, um, to continue working on, on the farm and in the fields with my family. And, um, but I was missing something and I was missing that group. I still felt so isolated and I was like, where in my life did I feel so good and so supported and so clear and so powerful and it was back in the military. So I said, I'm going to find those people. And actually, one day I get an email from those people <laughs> saying, hey, would you be interested in joining um, the Farmer Veteran Coalition and establishing a Connecticut chapter? And I was like, Ooh, absolutely, let's do this. <laughs> so, you know, we, we just hopped on the phone with each other and we started, um, I mean, it's an amazing, amazing team of, of brilliant people and everyone is motivated and we just kept kept the ball rolling, kept things going. So the Farmer Veteran Coalition, um, Connecticut, we support other farmers in creating, and this is not the perfect, <laughs> this is not our exact motto, my apologies to the team, um, creating a sustainable future in agriculture for Connecticut, okay? And supporting the veteran community. So we, all have a myriad of different expertises. I mean, I, I grow vegetables. I love, I love vegetables. I would love to talk with you about excess vegetables and how to get them to your people, to your food pantry, if you're into that. You know, oh, you and I are into oh, that. That was, that was an okay. Yeah. And so we'll Maybe talk closer. And, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's been it's been amazing being a part of being a part of that team again, you know. Um, we just we bring a 
ton of diverse intellect to the group and strengths and we're all working together to support our community and there is a huge movement as I mean as you see there's a national group there's other groups veterans to farmers and, and us um, getting veterans back into agriculture many people from the midwest left their farms went to the military and now they're coming back to their farms and just you know just as I had I had done. Um, we have that drive, we have that dedication, we have that embrace the stock attitude, you know, let's let's drive on, you know, if it ain't raining and we're not in pain, then it's not happening, you know. Um, so it's it's a great way to get us back on track as feeling, feeling a purpose, a greater purpose, serving something, serving the community, serving the environment. Um, changing demographics, you know, it's, it's been, it's been great to be a part of the team again. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, so I think, um, we're going to do some questions. We've had each of our panelists, uh, talk about what they do in farming and what brought them to agriculture. And so now, um, we're going to start with Reverend Sarah and go like this. Um, so, what do you find your biggest is your biggest challenge in what you do? Well, as a nonprofit farm, our biggest thing is sustainability. We've now built out, we've got four different growing methods. Most of our equipment is our capital is purchased. And that was the big expensive thing. We had thought it would be $300,000 and it was $650,000, $100,000. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. but that's mostly done and we've been raising money. But now, okay, how do I keep these people employed? How do we keep it? The, do we have any? So we like, we have a mission price that we sell everything really low at farmer's markets. We have a store uh, in, in our farm. Um, of course, at pantries. Uh, the wonderful thing that the Department of Ag has done is the Connecticut Food Share will purchase ours through the, um, you know, farm to pantry program. And in, in, I'll tell you, when I signed that contract and they said, I was like, I don't know if it's really going to work. And I walked into my pantry and I said, what do we have? We have moldy cabbage. We have this, we have that. I'm like, oh, and I looked down and there was Nourish Indoor Farm Green. And I went, wait a minute, we grew that. So it was like it started at our farm, went into the system and landed at our food pantry facility 10 miles away. So it was just, it worked. And I was like, oh, it works, something works. But I think the biggest <laughs> challenge then is sustainability because yes, we'll need some grants always because we're nonprofit. We need to, so we have some people, like I said, we have the mission price. Then we have the mission support price. And we have certain chefs uh, uh, come from all the fancy, you know, hoo -hoo restaurants, and which I love to eat at. Um, and they're going to pay this amount. That's but right. that keeps it going for the people who can't pay. Love so, it. Love it. so anyway, the, and our thing goes in the menu. And we, so we get a little PR. But they, they get the best, freshest thing. This one guy came in, he's from... Um, the cottage in Westport's a very oh, nice nice restaurant. Yes. Yes. And he said, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he said, <laughs> he said, I can't use these herbs on basting meat. They are too good to waste. I was like, <laughs> you can use them, buy them, buy them. <laughs> so we're, we're attracting chefs. We're attracting for-profit customers. We have a botanical company that is going to, uh, uh, we're going to consult with them on how to start an indoor hydroponic farm for their flower and their botanicals. But a section is going to be for vegetables that they then distribute through us because we're in that pantry system. So I think that the sustainability, but I'll tell you a more practical right now problem we were just talking about, containers. We we use plastic at first. We did because they're three cents and it keeps this for three weeks fresh in your refrigerator. It's just amazing, but it's plastic. Mm -hmm. And Connecticut's not good about doing groups. No, so we're, we're, we're working on it. Yeah. Legislators <laughs> vote for our uh, bill. Yes, yes. I, I'm so pleased you're working on it because, you know, we all want that and we don't want it incinerated in Bridgeport. But, uh, um, well, because I have to do their funerals when they die of cancer. And, you know, it's, it's a double whammy oh, on my profession. No, no, no. And so, actually, this is this is what our Environmental Protection Commissioner is working on, right? Um, how can we stop 
shipping all our recyclables, which we dutifully collect like over there. And we think it's getting recycled, but it's actually going to landfills mm -hmm. in Ohio or Pennsylvania or being incinerated, yeah. right? So we've actually gotten bids from uh, different, very large businesses that actually separate out plastic, um, food waste, turn it in, you know, anaerobic congesters. Mm -hmm. So you have one place that's doing all of that recycling, uh, making energy, but also, you know, turning it back to some of those products like so glass or paper. Yeah, yeah. So we just Thank need you. we just need and we'll put the pressure to bear on that. Yes, please. but the, the the packaging is hard because like we have to hole punch it to get aeration and it won't hold as long. Well nobody wants to the and we pick no, it I'm first, eat that tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But you see what I'm saying? So we've got to work together yeah. because she has that same so issue. Probably. And you know, so I would think that's a you know, you have a long-term sustainability, short term. I need a package, you know. So that's just uh, but I've got a packaging guy working on it. Working <laughs> you got a guy. I, I got a guy working on it, yeah. <laughs> well I I mean there's there are there's a lot of opportunities. The one of the greatest things about our farm is that we figured out, we've kind of dialed in how to grow the sugar kelp. Um, we can do that very well, but it's trying to figure out a place for it to go after we grow it. So we, we have a, a market. Yeah, we're, it's finding a market. It's creating a market. So working with chefs like Brian Lewis, who are open to different, they're open to weird because they're so committed to local. And he owns Cottage and Oko in yeah. Westport, just a little plug for him. Um, okay. So uh, finding chef partners like that, absolutely fantastic, but it's it's gonna take more than that. So we have a partnership with a nonprofit um, called the Yellow Farmhouse in Connecticut, who's been working to try and get sugar kelp as part of the curriculum in um, the public education system. They're working with culinary educators at you know in high schools and things like that. You would love that. Um, ideas. No, we're, we're, we'll talk. Yeah, Eric, um, yeah. Eric, Eric Dawson, he's one of my buddies. He'll be out on the boat with me on Monday. Um, so it's it's creating, it's trying to find opportunities to educate the public. So we, and it's this is all farmer led. We put on a seaweed week every year in the state of Connecticut and it celebrates the harvest. So we work with um, uh, mostly restaurants that hug what the shoreline. The seaweed week this year starts April 20th. It's more than a week. It starts April 20th and it ends May 1st. Um, and during seaweed week, you have the opportunity to take okay, the uh, ag commissioner and I are going to come. Absolutely. I already did and commit. Hi. Okay. Yeah, we're on it. Um, so we have the opportunity to learn. There's classes that you can participate in. There's um, a, a, like a cocktail class at the Mystic Seaport where we're going to be, you know, all, all types of opportunities. Where you can, oh, it is so much better than you think. Um, <laughs> see, see, we're going to bad because people are used to it. <laughs> but you got to get the local when you when you harvest seaweed fresh out of the ocean it actually is crispy it's like a crisp amazing noise yeah because what people are used to is what they find on the shore it's dry and it's it's been sad or it's been dried out and again i'm not knocking dried seaweed but that's what i probably use the most at home because it's shelf stable it lasts forever you can use it um, as a seasoning you can reconstitute it in water there's so many different ways to use it but um but again, I see I'm constantly educating. I'm always okay. I'm always trying to explain to people about yeah. exactly. I'm always I'm always trying to explain yeah, trips. Oh yes. Oh, we've, we've I've already put out calendar. Okay. Um. So so things like uh, the, any opportunity that I have. So the seaweed week is tremendous because it allows people anybody can go to uh, one of the participating restaurants and the chefs, the Brian Lewis's uh, throughout the state of Connecticut have um, created something using their incredible talents and gifts to help educate, you know, they have a much broader reach than I have. They can help educate kind of the, the community on kelp. And so, I, you know, I'm trying to find all different types of places uh, that are, you know, we're still getting people to sign about up. about supplement companies because they sell kelp? Uh, there's, there's so many different opportunities. So back to the plastic thing, I would love to see a seaweed-based container that I can put my seaweed in. And these are all like this is right. this these are industrial opportunities okay. that would help up this the where market. Paul comes in. Oh. <laughs> manufacturing officer. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Okay. okay. Um, but okay. these are these are opportunities aside from just growing more kelp off of the coast of Connecticut. There's so many other um, 
adjacent industries that can be uplifted. And all of this would be supporting farmers who are growing something that's helping fight climate change. Well, and like we're doing a culinary arts academy to give people that are in our food pantry mm -hmm. lines or in English classes, we're, we're an immigrant alley in Bridgeport, and to give them a skill with food that's grown here because they're good cooks back in Syria, but they don't live there yeah. anymore for a lot of reasons. So, uh, but then say, okay, now let's feed other people. But I think the educational component was you gotta huge. Do it. And so let's get not only get her kids, let's get the folks in my line. So then when we give it out, they go, what is this? They go, oh, we'll eat this tonight. And this is why I said I would come down and teach a class on basic cooking for seaweed yes, for anybody perfect. who would be willing to listen. Cool. And like, cool. Definitely a seaweed puppet. Like I'm thinking of seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. So the Lawrence. Your biggest <laughs> challenge, which Lauren wants to start. All right. Uh, biggest challenge, let's see, there's a couple. Um, kids, women, <laughs> no, kids, kids and women feeling like they can't be involved because getting dirty is wrong. And it's bad. Exposing yourself to germs, our whole, the whole way our society works now is let's, let's spray this, let's sanitize this. And it's why we get so sick all the time. So telling kids, whether it's at school, yes, pick up the food out of the, out of the garden bed, you know, pick the berries off the, the vine. You don't have to, or the bush, you don't have to wash it. It is clean. You know, I wouldn't do that off the roadside, but, um, <laughs> That's such a huge thing. I mean, at, at my farm stand, kids would come in, they'd be playing. My kids would always be like in their diapers on the ground and they'd be, you know, with trucks and people would bring in trucks and they'd be digging and they, then they'd go grab a peach and they'd eat the peach and they'd be like all muddy. And I, I didn't care. And we do it out in the fields too. And the kids would come in and they, they'd want to play with my kids. And then they'd go, no, no, don't, don't get dirty. You can't get dirty. Well, yeah, you can get dirty. Okay, and it's okay, and it's okay, you know, I don't look like this when I'm out in the field, and it's okay, I'm still, I'm still me, I'm still powerful, I'm still awesome, being dirty, I love being dirty and sweaty more than anything else. Um, and you're still a woman. And yeah, I'm absolutely. still a woman, and that's okay, it's okay to be strong, it's okay to have the muscles, it's okay to, to be independent and to choose something for yourself and to grow that food to create that business to do whatever it is and and women and it starts with kids really it's okay and having having the education as an adult um like this lauren i made an online course <laughs> called agricultural academy more gear, geared towards adults um because even if you don't want to farm, you can set something up on your balcony, whether it's a hydroponic system, it's a tower garden, it's buckets, five gallon buckets. I've grown tons in five gallon buckets. You're still feeding yourself. That's, that's hundreds to thousands of dollars of money you don't have to spend for such a minimal input um, for seeds. And the other thing, so that's stigma. That's stigma around getting dirty, being, being strong, being outside, okay? Um, eating dirt. Um, the other thing is financial investing and planning for women, because as a farmer, we have the smallest return on investment aside from like, I think, I think construction and personal training, which I've been involved in all of them. Um, and it's so hard to let go of that little bit of money. Cause you're like, what's going to happen next year? You can do all the risk mitigation you want. But then, you know, this, this new bug came in on a ship from somewhere and you're, you're done, you know? So knowing when and how much and where to invest for ourselves, put the power back in us, put the power back in our pockets so we can put the power back in our community. We're making the decisions as to what to do with our businesses because, because we have that income and we're building on it because we're investing and that's our choice our power our independence and as as women as a whole throughout society like we're behind on the power curve on that so having 
having instruction on that, having a place to do that um, is, is what we need. Fabulous. Fabulous. Agreed. Amazing. I totally agree. Uh, also, I definitely eat dirt. And I feel like that's how you don't get sick. Oh, it's part of it. It's bacteria, <laughs> microbiome. Um, yeah. I would say some of the biggest barriers, and I might sound like a broken record, but it, you know, it is a big part of like food apartheid that we're living with, but also like racism. Ooh, it's so hard. Like we can't even get to the part of like figuring out how to be more sustainable, how to do more things, because as Black women, we are very disrespected within the, the country and within our communities that we can't really move forward. And so those things really need to be addressed. Like, for example, I was growing in a community garden and got picked out for showing people how to grow food. So it's just like, that is an issue and we need more what? support. Yeah. That's what we, I was going to ask. Like, what, what exactly happens? I mean, I got friends who said, like, they cut my lease, they just oh, got yeah. nasty, all kinds of stuff happened. If, if they find out you're doing too many things that might like um, kind of be com competitive or compete, if that if any organizations are hoarding resources, they're gonna make sure that you can't do that work. Or like the land access, mm -hmm. or even the awareness of black women and black farmers who are doing it. Like there are so many people who grow just in Hartford, but can't because either there's certain policies or they can't get access to um, certain like resources that they need or like the water isn't on or like repairs. And that really affects our mental health. I'm gonna be honest, it, it didn't make my mental health cute. It also yeah. like the access to like things for physical health and getting support and people actually speaking up for you to be like, actually Lauren knows what she's talking about. It took me over 10 years of doing this work in Hartford to really kind of get to a place where I feel like I can speak up without being like blacklisted and being able just to do the work. Um, and I really don't want my students to have to deal with any of that. Just like the bi biggest barrier is that because it caused so much stress. Farming is the thing that I go to to like, feel connected and like have community. And it's very healing because so many other people who are farmers and growing are, will support me, but I like need more support. So I see like everyone here, you guys are, you guys are like, you know, white women have white privilege. Like I need you guys to be like, hey, have you heard about this person? Or like, do you like other farmers who are of color, you can say like, you know, do you know about this opportunity? And like speaking up and saying like, well, I just heard her say this. Did you listen to such and such? And like, finding opportunities for us to be heard because like they ignore us and I'm a loud, I'm a loud mouth. So like, <laughs> I'm gonna be like, well, actually and keep going and being persistent, but I've seen some people be broken. Oh yeah. And it's, it's hard. Like farming is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's like that plus the mental aspect and the, the racist barriers. It, I, the reason why I was all successful because I had some mentors who were white men who were like, I got you let me make sure to support you. And if they say anything, you let me know. Even at places when I was working in the agricultural field, they, I wasn't provided any training. So I had to go outside of my job and be like, hey, I need help. Help me do this because this, I'm not being properly compensated. I'm not being listened to when I bring up issues. And what I say is not important. It is not being heard. So I'm going to need people to co-sign me until I can get to a place where I can support others. And that's the reason why a lot of the students know that experience that and see that every day so when I, I talk to them and say like this is my experience with racism this is how I address it and like this is how some techniques and strategies that you guys can do please use that because like when I'm you know leaving my house I have to be aware like if I have too many tools and look too crazy I could get arrested or shot so I need to be a beak I have to like always be aware of how my skin color is going to affect people's perception of my ability of my skill. You know, people have corrected me and they're like, oh, you shouldn't grow the corn with that. And I'm like, uh-huh, yeah. And I know we all deal people talking over us, but it's kind of in a way where I'm always thinking like, it's because of the way I look, right. you know, did I, it, what is this? I always feel like I'm overcompensating. And that is super stressful. And so I feel like the biggest barrier is really to make sure that like, we need more awareness of some of those issues and like, Doing that will help um, release a barrier and have more support. Like I need more support and more recognition of my own work. And I need other people to have that recognition, not just me. And you can really like, see, you were saying how you're, you're working with kids and you're helping them change their perception of themselves and see different opportunities. And so Absolutely. if you just as one person fan out and impact so many other people. So without giving you the support, I mean, it, you're like the, 
most perfect example of just incredibly how yeah. important it is to oh, oh, so oh, right. oh, oh, really, oh, 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 what time is it? We are we're running out of time. We're kind of getting to the buff. No, and all these, all these were these yeah. women like so fabulous yeah. and so amazing. So do we have any questions? Because we're we're gonna let it go over like five minutes because these women have just generated, I'm sure, so many good questions. Any questions for anyone on Zoom? I'll go hi to my students if you don't. <laughs> she's she's just amazing. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Here's what. Why don't we do this? And we're going to start in reverse order. So for all those aspiring farmers out there, a piece of advice, but not too long, just because. Um, I would say walk around and see some awareness of what is growing in your area and carry a notebook everywhere and take notes on everything, everyone you see, because that is the community you're building and you're, you're doing asset mapping. That's going to be super, super key to knowing how that's going to help you grow. It's part of the, you know, the de developing and building that ecosystem. It's not just plants. It's also people, animals, bugs, stray cats, um, all the things. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> uh, find your people. You know, find your people, find, don't, don't do it alone. There's no reason to, you know, you've given me amazing assets just over the past few months. And this is, this is one of them. This is, this is huge. So find your people and work with them and don't be afraid to talk about whatever idea you have, even if it sounds totally off base, even if you change your mind every week because the right one is gonna happen and the right person is gonna listen and it's gonna resonate and it's all gonna come together. Um, I would say don't put yourself in a box too on that same, like farming is not old McDonald necessarily, it is us at this table and all of the weird ways that we approach it and it can be something that hasn't been done yet. So there's, and it is also the most, joyful thing outside obviously of having kids that I've ever done in my life. Yeah. So it is very, very fulfilling. Highly recommend. Don't be afraid to be mocked and laughed at and <laughs> told you, you can't do it. Because friends, we can. And this this is an example of something that we can do. People so make cute. fun of me and they're like, oh you're just a hick from Kentucky. And I'm like, no, I want to feed people. And we can do this. And we've had starts and stops and mistakes and that. Yes, believe in your dream. Believe you can do it and get the people around you to help. No, none of us do this alone. There's no I in team. And find your, find your people, but also work it. This takes work. My daddy worked hard out in the fields all the time too. But he also taught me, don't forget who this is for. This is for people to make life better, to give them hope. Every time, everything you all have done and all the other folks, you're throwing a rock and all the ripples, you're throwing a rock of hope into the, um, to the pond to make life better and more generous and healthier. And Lieutenant Governor, I just wanna say that, you know, for anyone who's like, oh, I can't call the state, they're so big, government. No, like, please reach out to us. I know each one of these women. We've all worked together in the past. I'm the Bureau Director of Ag Development. It's what we're here to do. And, and I don't want anyone to feel like they can't pick up the phone and call the agency and see us as a helpful resource. I have five amazing women in the Ag Development Unit. They are absolute rock stars and they are here to be supportive and helpful. So um, I know, I think everyone has talked to someone um, in the Ag Development Unit at some point in time. And I'm- And if you haven't, they you, can help you, you get too. started. You need to make your help you get started. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And, and I'm thankful for the relationship that we have with all of you. Um, and I don't see it any, anytime soon. At least well, not until and this grade one's grade. our role model. <laughs> yes. He called me and said, this is what you need to do. Okay, 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 okay. And then she next time I saw her, did you do it? Oh, yes, I did it. So, but she's leading the way. I think you're right on track that women have been told forever, you can't do this or you shouldn't do this or, you know, and nonsense. 
Oh, that I find nonsense. I find that the most motivating of all. <laughs> oh, I can't do that, really. <laughs> wow, <Yeah. laughs> the best for just is success. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! All cool. right. So we didn't have any questions, but one um person wanted all your contacts, so I did send it to that person. Oh, good. Nice. And then nice. um. One comment was, what a group of phenomenal women. So oh, very happy. Hi, day, everybody. <laughs> and right. I want to give a quick shout out. Thank you, UConn College of Ag, for hosting us today um, at your Farmington Harper County campus. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See everybody next time. All right. Have a good weekend.